<laughs> Yo, welcome to Delicious Vinyl TV. I'm Girly Stuff, and I'm so happy. Once again, we're here on the rooftop on Sunset Boulevard with really cool, a really special guest. I feel honored to have him directly from Detroit. He's back in L.A. He's going to talk about his new album, Stadium Music. Give it up for Frank Nitt, yo! Yeah! Woo. Frank Nitt! Whoa! Get a hug. No, get a hug. Yeah. Yep. Get, you get a hug. <laughs> See you brown in the house. Yeah. How you feeling? I'm good. I'm great. It's LA. It's warm. We on a rooftop. It's almost November, and I got on shorts. It's great. It's great. But it's been crazy, though. How, how did you feel the weather yesterday? Uh, it was really hot. I wasn't prepared. I just came from Detroit, oh, yeah, and it, well. it wasn't so hot. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but it's good. You know, Cali, I love Cali. You know, I get a, uh, I got a, a good family out here, people that take care of me. So, I love Cali. Big shout out to Cali. I love it. You've been partying, you told me, as well. Um, a little bit of partying. I uh, got to step out and uh, go to uh, Rizza's movie premiere. Okay. Dope movie. Go see it when it come out. Very dope uh, karate flick. If you like karate and hip-hop, holy crap. Rizza did it. Anyway, yeah. So, stadium music. Mm -hmm. You gonna drop it? Um, I think he got something queued up there. That's yeah, this is um, this is so large. Just the uh, first track on oh, the record, shit, nigga, this and it's really a, just. I think I needed to get a lot of aggression out first, just to start the tone, set the tone, and then kind of, you know, ease it out as I go. So. This was very aggressive. Very aggressive. In a Detroit vibe. You want to put it in LA right now? What up, dog? Yeah. Nigga, Frank Nitt, and I'm back like niggas. And then, you know, it was kind of like, I'm here. Turn this on, and you know I'm in the building type thing. It's delicious vinyl. Well, yeah. Well, you know, this is home. This is a, my LA base right here. I love this place. Yeah. Here's your album. I hope y'all can see that real clear. Go buy that for your grandmother and your kids and your aunties and your uncles and all your cousins and everybody you know. And uh, matter of fact, buy them two copies, one for Christmas and one for their birthday. There you go. Tell us about it. Like, stadium music, it also includes this book that you work with Tara Lynn Fox. Yes, uh, she actually, uh, well, I, didn't, I can't say that I actually wrote this book. I uh, sat down and recorded it on the mic and just told my story and then she took it transcribed it and we edited it from what she transcribed so uh it wasn't necessarily us writing it it was just me speaking what i felt and then she put it into book form here you go right here so yeah it's an actual book a 48 page memoir of my musical journey if you will <laughs> and uh no it's dope though it's a dope book uh real easy read and you know got some dope pictures some things like that that's the view from the underground that's the book side and then you hear stadium music playing which is the album side i produced all the tracks i got thank on there and illa j and qd and and a few uh artists from overseas from amsterdam and germany and so it's a it's a very uh emotional emotional record it, it just kind of i wanted to do something that, that wasn't what you normally hear especially for me you know what i mean so i kind of express some feelings and all this other type of stuff you know what i'm saying so yeah it was fun though because me doing all the production it kept it uh it was very personal a very personal record for me yeah so i love it though tell us a little bit about about that journey like i want to know well tell us how did you went like how was that journey actually going like starting from break dancing to then like DJing on those high school parties and then going to like being an MC and then actually producing your own stuff well I mean as you just listed it was kind of in the in the uh, line of progression you get what I'm saying so like this this book and album represents a lot not only the production side and then the author side but as well as this is on my own label my own imprint digipop and this is the first official release we got worldwide distribution you know digital digital and physical so you know this is a really big record for me just as a person you get what i'm saying and, and uh like i said it's just part of the progression you know i i kind of got tired of having to wait on beats from producers so 
I decided to make my own. You get what I'm saying? It wasn't nothing against anyone else. Everybody got their schedule and all that, but I wanted to have them when I wanted them, so I started making them. You get what I'm saying? So, and then the same thing with the label. I felt as though I've been lucky. I've worked with a lot of great labels, Delicious Vinyl included, and, and I still work with Delicious Vinyl to this day. And, uh, you know, it's... It, Mike, the boss here, uh, actually helped facilitate this deal, my distribution deal. So, you know, it, it was just a good time for me to step out, get my own label, and I got, you know, good teachers like Mike Ross and other people in the world that's helped me out, you know? So you think, like, this album really encapsulates all of those passages in your life, through your life and music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I think it, it, it kind of encompasses my life even though my life is a little crazy this album is not one-sided it's all over the place you're gonna hear all different types of beats and different tones and different it's not a, a straight straight through record it's here and there and everywhere so that definitely uh definitely uh, uh mimics my life in a sense you know what i'm saying because you know i've been all over the world i've you know lived in toronto lived in california lived in detroit i've you know traveled to china and and uh, russia and all over europe and just i've done all these different things so this record kind of represents all of that you get what i'm saying as well as this book because i tell those stories as well so and and you know i wanted the two to reflect each other in some way and i think it's just by the range of things that you get from my life and the music represents that as well as the book so there you go so you better cop that album you got to read that book what does frank Ned have to tell in that story oh man it's just my journey it just uh you know people know me for different things i guess i mean mostly for my affiliation to dilla and and frank and dank and you know me touring and doing all that different stuff and so this kind of just opens that book more like you know you have an introduction to me but let me show you where it all started and to today because tomorrow it'll be something else to add to the story but you know it this was up until a point in my life you know what i'm saying and i'm still growing and gonna do more now but this just kind of showed you know where i come from you know what i mean from family to whatever oh. everything oh. everything tell us oh. how it all started with frank and dank that project oh. Oh man. Well, first off, you got to know that we were friends. We all, me, him, and Dilla, were friends. Well, him and Dilla was friends first before that. But in 1986, we all met, right? So, uh, Frank and Dank was very, uh, very organic how it came about. It wasn't, um, wasn't forced. Like I was already in in another group before and was in the basement with Dilla just just rapping just you know he would make a beat we'd rap that was it you know what i mean it was and it was just it was actually dilla and t3 from slum village it was their idea for us to do frank and dank and dank already was named dank before frank and dank was a group you get what i'm saying actually it was president dank work anybody who knows the story it was president dank work and we shrunk it to dank anyway so yeah uh yeah yeah no but uh so that was just kind of you know the homies all together we was kids you know 17 18 years old and Like I said, T3 and Dude was like, yo, y'all should just do a group. So he said, all right, let's do it. Frank and Dank, here it is. So yeah, it was very, you know, just homeboys doing what they love in group form. I don't know, it, you know, it wasn't anything thought out, pre-planned, or it was just an or organic happening. I'm something like you know. a vet. Now that and give us some updates on like 48 hours. What's going on with that? Well, 48 hours. Hmm. Uh, for those who don't know, <laughs> 48 hours was uh, a, a, a Dilla produced Frank and Dank record that we did when we had our deal with MCA Records. Uh, some years back. Um, well, let's just say that 48 hours will appear to you very soon, right? Very, very soon. You'll be able to get 48 hours in the deluxe edition, and it's gonna be very, very good. So, uh, I ain't gonna say when, I ain't gonna say how, I'm just gonna say that it's gonna happen. It will be 48 hours. Frank and Dank, production by Dilla. Yeah. 48 hours imagine that oh i wish i wish i could give it to you in two days two days no i can't do it, can't do it. <laughs> really hoping to listen to that it's gonna be out so stay tuned for that now since we're in delicious vinyl yeah. i want you to tell us about your first days here 
Like, I want to know about those days where Mike Flaws was driving you on a Lexus and all that stuff, blah, blah. Yeah, well, I was, you know, I was a fly on the wall, right? Like, he actually flew Dilla out here to do some work with uh, India Davenport. And, uh, and I just kind of came along as Dilla's homeboy, and he just flew me out. And he, we was uh, down the street on, well, we was actually around the corner on Hollywood with the hotel. And, you know, we went and we worked. And then after work, it was time to go out and party. But Mike wasn't partying with us. He was just going to take us to the party, right? So he piled us into the nice loop Lex Coupe. And this, this at the time when the Lex Coupe was like, Ooh, that's a Lex Coupe, right? So, yeah. So we got in the car and we rolled up. So I said, it was my first time here as an adult. So I was like bugging out, you know, palm trees and sunshine. And, you know, it was just great. So he took us to the strip club, dropped us off. Had a great time. Had a great time. Oh, the good old days. Well, them days ain't that old. But still, uh, it was great, though. It was real good. It was real good. Uh, strip club, California. Thumbs up. How did it go then from that to strip clubs to the actual jewels in my backpack? Well, you know what? That happened, wow, uh, almost 15 years later, right? That they came, well, it was 10 years later or something like that. But I just happened to be here hanging out with Illa J, which is Dilla's little brother. And he was working on his Yancey Boys album that came out on Delicious Vinyl, which was an album with him produced by his brother. And um, I just happened in passing to tell Mike, yo, I got some things for you to listen to. And in that batch of records that I had, there were a few joints from Jules in my backpack in there. And those were the ones that he picked. He thought that he liked those the most. He was like, I like those the most. So we went with that. And we put out Love first as a single. We did a piece of vinyl and put it up digital. And, and it did well for us. And it was a good look for us. So he, he said, Frank, let's, let's go further. Let's do an EP. So got with Terrence Martin. And you know, at the time I was living out here, so it was it was easy. So we just very organically knocked it out, and you know, I, I can't say enough about Mike and Delicious Vinyl and, and the support they gave me as far as as an artist. You know what I'm saying? Just getting my name out there further, and you know, it was just a good look, it was a really good look. And we actually probably gonna do a Jewels in my backpack too to get ready. Yeah. And how was working with Terrence Martin? Very easy, surprisingly easy. It was very, you know. Was it, it was straight, we worked at his crib and we just went in and he had beats and he just pulled it up and was like, you like this? Yes, okay, let's do it. And we did it. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't any type of, we did 10 songs in three days. So it was very, like we was on a three song a day kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah, no, it was uh, It was very, very easy. Very just, just we, we felt the vibe. We got the vibe and just and ran with it, you know? So very dope. He's very, you know, he, he plays all instruments, drums, horns, keys, bass, whatever you could think of. And he's just really creative and and comes from a jazz and a church background. So it's like he got a lot of soul. So he's just really dope, really creative guy. He's really easy to work with. Him. Is, get, is he going to actually produce some of the tracks for the next Jewels in My Backpack? He's doing the whole thing again. That's that's the formula. Him on production, me on the raps, and you know, that's it. That's it right there. Yeah. The West Coast and Detroit like meeting up again. Yeah. So dope. And what's up like touring with this new album? Um, well I was supposed to actually be on tour uh in November, but I'm not going for some reason. I, I don't know. I'm just my schedule is such that I just can't go, I guess. Uh, but, you know, I'm really busy with my new job as curator of Dilla's uh, music catalog. So, uh, like, I'm out here handling business for that, actually. So, it's, it's keeping me really busy. So, I don't, I don't know when I'm going to be able to tour again. I'm hoping top of next year, uh, you know, spring next year, I'll be able to get out or something. But right now, I'm so busy and I have so many things I have to get done. It's very tough to even think about doing a show. Let alone even making new music right now. It's just crazy. Yeah. How do you feel? You just mentioned you were named the chief curator of Jay Dilla's music catalog. How do you feel that? Where do you want to like take that legacy to? Well, I mean, I just think that um, it's a very personal thing for me. Obviously, I, you know, before he passed, I knew him for more than 20 years, and you know, it'll be almost 27 now. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, I just think, I just want what's best for him and his legacy. You know what I'm saying? The things, 
where I think he should be, where his his name should be spoke upon as well with other great artists in certain places that he's not. So I feel like that's kind of what I'm here to do, to kind of just push that envelope and try to put him as far out there and as far into the, the, the world as I can. So everybody who can appreciate his greatness can can appreciate it. You get what I'm saying? That's all it really is, just trying to give access to all the people that will appreciate what he does and appreciate his skill level and the music that he left for us before he he went away you know what i mean like so i just really think that that's kind of my mission and the mission of his mother and and her her company yancy media group which is the company that's uh, like running his estate now you know what i'm saying they're in charge of all his affairs as far as music and coming to get music and in, using his image and likeness you have to basically talk to me and i deal with them and that's how that's the hierarchy you get what i'm saying so uh I think it's just very important that we, our plan is to put him in a great place and, and allow his legacy to grow and, and be looked upon, you know, as a, as a, a great thing and a great, a great uh, portrait of, of, of a really gifted person. You get what I'm saying? So that's what we're trying to do. It's such a big influence for a lot of people, a lot of beat makers right now. And um, what about Rebirth of Detroit? What do you think about that? It was released early this year. You were on it on one of the tracks with Illa J. Tell us about that. Um, well, you know, I, it was really um, the idea of his mother. His mother just wanted to do something to with her son's music to try to get back to the city of Detroit and help the artists of Detroit because that's where her son came from. And his artistry left an uh, imprint on Detroit and helped a lot of artists such as myself and other people, you know, have a career in this thing. So uh, I think it was really just his mother trying to reach out and help people and, and do the best she could with the music. You get what I'm saying? And, you know, I think she did what she... I think she hit what she was trying to hit. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm an honest guy. I've talked to her. There's certain things on it maybe I wouldn't have done or I would have said, okay, well, let's try to do it another way or something. But that's not my judgment. You know what I'm saying? It's it's her label, her project. She's She is the boss. So out of my, uh, love and respect for her, I got to support her. And, and, and if, the, if that's what she wanted to do, then that's what she wanted to do. So, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it, it was good. It was exactly what she needed and exactly what she wanted to get done. And, and, and that's the most important thing. And, you know, so, yeah, we birthed the church great. Now as a curator, are you working on the projects with her as well? Yeah. She kind of left it up to me. She kind of says, you know, Frank, you do what you think is best. And I'll support you in that. Because she understands that, you know, me and Dilla's musical connection as well as our friendship was, you know, it's, it's real, you know what I'm saying? Like we were in that basement every day before there was a deal, before there was drum machines, before whatever, you know what I'm saying? So she gets that. So she allows me the elbow room to do what I need to do, what, what I think is gonna be strong for his legacy and, and for his family and his daughters and her and her, her son and her daughter. And it, you know, like it's bigger than just, it's, it's a family and it's people that's involved. It's bigger than just music. It's, it's a man's legacy. It's his legacy. Exactly. You know? And I think you're the right person to do it. And as you mentioned before, like he was your friend that became a producer, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's what happened. Like, when we met, he didn't make beats. You know what I'm saying? He didn't DJ. We all were little crazy dancers. You get what I'm saying? So we were working on dance routines. And until his Uncle Al showed him how to DJ, and then he showed me, and me and him started DJing parties. And then, you know, that went to making beats. And, you know, again, I was there when his father brought his first drum machine home. So, you know what I mean? Like, so, I got a real personal connection to that whole situation. That's all. And he was testing all his beats with you, MC Frank Nick. Well, nah, I don't consider him testing his beats. So, I consider him making me a better MC by allowing me to, by giving me beats. Our, our little thing was he would whip up a beat really quickly and he would then say okay we got this beat you got 30 minutes to write a rhyme and then we got to record it whatever it is it could be three bars or 30 bars whatever you get in that 30 minutes you better wrap it right so that i think it was him sharpening my skills he helped me out you know he didn't need my help he was the genius one i, I was just hanging out you know what I mean? <laughs> oh well what are we listening to right now let's see Oh, oh, this is called, uh, uh, I think it's Can I. Um, oh, no, actually, it's Can You. Can You, not Can I. But it's, uh, 
don't know, this record is weird. It, it's about a girl who wants to be with me, but I don't want to be with her. Right? So the chorus is kind of like the girl talking to me. Like, I'm telling her, girl, I know you want me. You want me to come give it to you right quick, don't you? You want us to be together, don't you? But we can't. We can't. We can't do it. We can't. Why? If you were telling me earlier today that you want one in your life. Well, I mean, you know, everybody wants to be loved. Don't understand. You know, I, I, I want to be loved, too. But, you know, I think we all would like to pick who loves us. I mean, I'm saying, I'm saying like you, I mean, you can't. Everybody could love you, but the one you let in your crib, you, could, you should be able to pick. That's all I'm saying. You prefer the strong women or the psychedelic freaky ones? Oh, man, I like a strong psychedelic freaky woman. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, I'm looking for the best of both worlds, if that's possible. Hey. Hey, I run shit. No, I don't have a case. Either she gonna like me or she not, you know. I don't really have the time. My schedule is so full. I don't really have the time to think. So she either just has to like me. Find that girl. Oh, she'll show up one day. She'll show up. She'll knock on my door. Say, hey, I'm here. I'm say, hey, come on in. I was cooking some chicken for you. Come on. Yeah. That's how they go. I was just in the studio making a song about you, girl. Come on. That's how they go. <laughs> You're gonna kill her with that. Hey, and guess what? Uh, yeah. We got DJ Dazzle here from Chile that you actually made a collab with him. Yeah, yeah, we did. We uh, He actually uh, uh, booked me and Illa J to, to come to Chile, right? This guy right here, this is DJ Dazzle right here. You know, this is my guy. He, take, he took care of me in, 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 in Chile. And uh, he got us there and we recorded a song. And then um, he was like, okay, I'm gonna shoot the video too while y'all there. We were there only two days. And we had a show one of those days. He somehow shot the video while we were recording the song. It was like all, all at the same time. He didn't give us no time. And then, and then right before the airport, he made us shoot another scene somewhere else. Yeah, he was on one. So, but the video came out really dope, and <laughs> and the song is really crazy, right? Yeah, but he, this is my guy. He's incredible. So he's in Cali now too. So I'm trying to get him to uh, take me back down south. I've been bugging him about it, but he ain't set it up yet. So that's why I ain't touring. It's Dossel's fault. Because <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm blaming him. I should be in South America right now. I should be on my way down and around, but I'm not. I am not. But it's cool. Everything is good. So what's coming up then? You have too many projects. Yeah, um, and most of them I can't really speak about, but what I can say is uh, February 2013, we're doing another Dilla Day Detroit, February 9th. Um, it's going to be great. We got some great acts lined up. Um, it's going to be in Detroit. We got some releases lined up. That's going to coincide with February 9th with the actual uh, uh, Dilla Day. And so, yeah, we got, I can't tell you. I want to tell you everything, but I can't. No, I just, I would just say it's some unreleased, unheard Dilla. And, and, and it's, it, and it's Dilla rapping too. It ain't just beats. It's like him with flows and everything. So it's incredible, incredible stuff. So, and that's as far as I can go. Just, but know that I am serious. I am so serious right now, and and, and uh, yeah, it's going down. I've seen you in Mike Ross' office lately. What's going on with that? Well, you know, I stay in Mike Ross's office. He's like um, he's like a, a Jewish big brother. He he takes care of me, and if I need to borrow a little bit of cash, no, no, I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. No, no, no. No, me and Mike always, we, we stay doing business. We always have things going on. Even if I'm not here, we keep a line of communication. So me being in his office is nothing new. <laughs> Look at that face. That's a... <laughs> it's quite normal that I'm in Mike's office. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll leave it at that. I'm just, I'm just going to say that there are surprises coming, and uh, it's going to be a lot of good music and a lot of things good going on. That's all. Having you here is so good. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, everybody. We even got a peanut gallery. It's great up here. You should be here. If you're not here, you're missing out. Sorry. I'm going home now. I'm going to catch this flight. Yeah, I'm going to Detroit tonight. So I'm going to go into Mike's office. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going home. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Big up for Frank Nitt. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh.
and everybody get that album Stadium Music. Don't miss out. Everybody's streaming right now. Don't leave because we're going to start with the Sunset Scratch session hosted by a homeboy here, C Brown. So, C Brown, what's up next? Well, what's up next? We got, uh, wait, this mic is kind of hot. We got uh, some of LA's finest turntablists in the house tonight. They're going to be showcasing their skills. Going to have y'all in the bedroom practicing once again. So stay tuned, y'all. We're going to bump some more of this Frank Knit real quick and uh, keep it locked. Peace. Thank you, C. Brown. I'm Burley Stock. C. Brown, Frank Knit in the house as well. Don't stay tuned right there. Delicious Vinyl TV from Sunset Boulevard. Peace. Cause